Hi, is that the doctor covering Purple One Medicine? Yes, patient in 3805 just spiked the fever 102.5. Last blood pressure is at 80 over 35. And I think the patient is now starting to get confused. Call CCM. And welcome back to our ICU series. If you're new here, my name is Fatai and I'm a hospitalist working in South Carolina. On this channel, I teach medicine and I discuss topics around medical education. So please consider subscribing by hitting the subscribe button below and the notification button next to it so you can get the videos as I upload them. In this video, I'll be going over some of the general considerations when it comes to the management of sepsis and septic shock. This is the first video in a four part video series around uh, management of sepsis and septic shock. So look out for the coming videos. Let's begin by defining sepsis and septic shock. Sepsis is basically a dysregulated host response to an infection characterized by the presence of organ dysfunction in addition to an identifiable infectious source. Septic shock, on the other hand, is basically all of that with hypotension, basically mean arterial pressure of less than 65, uh, that hasn't responded to fluid resuscitation, requiring presses to keep it above 65. So sepsis, dysregulated host response to an infection with organ dysfunction, for example, lactic acidosis, in addition to an identifiable infectious source, septic shock, all of that with mean arterial pressure of less than 65 with fluid resuscitation that's not requiring pressures to keep it above 65. Patients in sepsis and septic shock can present with a wide variety of, uh, of symptoms, uh, but some of the common ones will be things like altered mental status, um, patients uh, with tachypnea. Uh, obviously, they have some temperature dysregulation, so it could be fever, all right, or hypothermia. Uh, either of them will suggest septic shock, uh, sepsis uh, or septic shock if there's hypotension. Uh, and, um, you know, some of them may, for example, be sent from a nursing home with hypotension and fever and things like that. So all of these things should start to, you know, trigger in your mind that this could possibly be sepsis or septic shock. Uh, we have several tools to determine or to assess patients that are critically ill from sepsis or septic shock that will then determine how quickly we escalate the treatment of that patient. So those two tools, for example, the QSOFA score or the news to score. So these are tools that basically if you if a patient has a significant score on these tools, it means that they have a higher risk of mortality or higher risk of staying long in the ICU, requiring intensive care for a longer time. So now that we know that these patients may be in sepsis or septic shock, how do we manage it? Like with every patient that does decompensating, you know, whether you're in the ED or you're in the floors or you're in the ICU, your initial assessment will require you to do your airway breathing and circulation. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind, uh, keep in mind with patients with sepsis and septic shock is that their respiratory status start to get compromised and you want to keep an eye on that. If they require oxygen, you should give them oxygen in that initial period. So once you've initially assess them and you've stabilized them, the next thing you want to do is to get your lines. Uh, peripheral lines with wide bore are just good enough. You don't necessarily need a central line uh, that early. So basically two wide bore peripheral lines will do the work. After you've gotten your lines, the next consideration will be to get your blood samples, you know, things like your blood culture. The important thing to keep in mind with blood uh, culture will be getting the blood culture from two separate sites. Peripheral blood culture, by the way, not through central lines or anything like that. Peripheral blood uh, cultures from two separate sites, uh, two sets, all right? So one set from one site and another set from another site. Um, you also want to get your lactic acid levels. Uh, you also want to get your, um, uh, your basic regular lab, CBC, CMP. And you can get uh, blood gas as well because blood gases may show you the presence of acidosis and that may also alter your management in a way. So once you've gotten your labs, the next thing will be to think about something we'll call the bundle. Uh, some people call it a three hour bundle or some people call it like a one hour bundle. I, I prefer to see it as a one hour bundle. So it just, it means that it's gonna be done faster. So that bundle basically contains getting your blood culture, getting your lactic, uh, uh, lactic acid, giving the patient broad spectrum antibiotics, and giving them fluids. The fluid recommendation will basically be uh, 30 cc per kg in the space of about three hours. For recommendations regarding the choice of fluids, I did a video about that in my IV fluids lecture. You can you know access that on the card above here. So we think about those things in bundle. I, I like to 
think about doing them at the same time. Get your blood culture, give antibiotics, obtain your lactate, and give fluids according to the goal. Of all of these things, I would probably say giving the antibiotics is, is the most important thing because uh, they've been able to, the recommendation, at least uh, according to the surviving sepsis campaign of 2016, I believe, is um, to give antibiotics within the first hour. And there is some evidence that with every hour delay of uh, giving antibiotics, the mortality of the patient goes up. So you definitely want to consider that. Obviously, you know, giving fluids is, is, is also very important and you want to give it according to the goal. So after you've done all of these things, what I would normally do is to, for example, recycle the patient's blood pressure. You know, I've given them fluids, I've given them antibiotics, I've, getting, I've gotten the initial labs and, and, and all of that. I want to recycle the, blood, uh, the vitals, right? Because it tells me whether they're responding to the fluids I'm giving them or whether I need to do something else. And what we normally would do in a patient that's not responding to the fluids that you've given them initially is to start pressures. The idea is to start presses as soon as possible, not wait, you know, and give them 10 liters of, of fluids before you consider starting presses. Uh, and when you, you're going to start presses, the, the first line presser is uh, norepinephrine. It's important for you not to get, you know, bogged down by whether to give, you know, these presses via peripheral line or a central line. If obviously you're going to be around the patient in that initial resuscitation period. So it's okay to give the presses, for example, norepinephrine, via a perif good peripheral line, as long as somebody's watching that to prevent, you know, to avoid extravasation and necrosis of the skin and things like that. But while you're doing that, you're thinking about getting your central line, obviously. Um, uh, the recommendation for central line would be really the fastest place you can. Uh, so you have options of the fem femoral, you have options of the uh, subclavian or IJ. Um, but what I would say is, you know, because if you put a femoral line, you most likely have to remove it as soon as everything stabilizes and you can put a neckline. So if you have your ultrasound next to you and the press is already running via peripheral line, you can go ahead and put your, your you know, your IG or subclavian. Subclavian do subclavian without ultrasound guidance. But um, with the femoral line, if you feel like there would be any hindrance from you getting an ultrasound, putting an IG and all of that, it's okay to just go ahead and put a femoral line. As long as you're getting the central line in them as soon as possible and you're able to run the presses now through the central line. So after I've stabilized them, you know, recycled blood pressure, if it's still low, I started my presses. Uh, I got the central line to, uh, uh, to put the, to continue the presses in. I would then want to do a thorough systemic assessment because you know out of that systemic assessment you can pick up areas that uh, I mean areas of the management that's falling short and you can address that but in addition to that you can also focus on the source of the infection because if you don't find the source of infection and address that source of infection everything else you're doing doesn't really carry any weight at that point so you want to identify the source of infection while you're doing your thorough systemic assessment you know uh, uh, with the source of infection, you're thinking about the common places, for example, the chest, you know, get your chest x-ray. If that doesn't tell you much, you can get your CT chest. Look at the urine, it's a common place, you know, if there's, if it's not unremarkable, some people would suggest probably getting a pan CT. Or even before then, you can look at the skin. If, for example, patient is bed bound, nursing home patient, for example, they may have skin ulcers or pressure ulcers that is the source of infection. Um, and uh, uh, again, if any of those common places are remarkable, you want to get, for example, your pan CT that looks at the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to rule out any source of infection there. Other places you should think about if, you still don't find any possible source of infection is, you know, your right upper quadrant, for example, to rule out the cholecystitis, get your sono, may require HIDA or, or not, um, because in that case, if there's a cholecystitis, your best bet is putting a tube and draining that. All of the IV, uh, antibiotics you give may not necessarily, you know, uh, help. Um, you also want to so to think about the heart, for example, for example, in patients that have, you know, indwelling catheters like a, a, a perma catheter, dialysis catheter, you want to, you want to, you know, rule out the, the endocarditis as a source of infection. Um, obviously, I've encountered a lot of that. Um, you also want to think about places like your, the spine, and that's why we do MRI regardolinum, for example, to rule out abscesses and things like that in the spine. Um, so again, your, your goal is to find a source of infection because if you don't find a source of infection, everything else you're doing just you know, sometimes feels like a waste. When it comes to systemic uh, assessment, obviously you're going from your neuro, your respiratory, your cardio, you're looking at everything and making sure you're doing everything right. Uh, with the respiratory, for example, you know, it's important to stabilize respiration for these patients septic, septic, septic shock. Some of them require oxygen, some of them are in outright respiratory failure that you have to address, whether with oxygen supplementation or even 
more. And some of them are just, you know, in altered mental status, which is, you know, basically an indication for intubation. Glaucoma scale of less than eight is an indication for intubation, mechanical intubation and mechanical ventilation. Um, uh, one of the ideas also with that is, you know, with shock generally, you have significant compromise of organ you know, perfusion. And if you think about a cardiac output, a huge amount of it, probably about 20% go into the lungs. If the lungs are suffering and you're not able to address that, it will eventually overwhelm the system. So it's okay to consider intubating a patient that is in, you know, sepsis, uh, in septic shock uh, to try to relieve that stress. And obviously if they're in respiratory failure, that also addresses and if they're in automatization, that also addresses it. Um, some of the other organs you want to think about, for example, the kidneys, right? You want to make sure there's adequate urine output. The goal for urine output is basically 0.5 cc per kg per hour. So if you have a male of about 70 kg, you expect that they're making about uh, uh, 35 uh, uh, cc per hour. If they're not, you may want to address that. We'll do another video about how to, you know, uh, address oligure in critically ill patients. Um, you also want to think about the acid base, for example. Uh, the indication for giving bicarb in patients with uh, sepsis, septic shock would be pH of less than 7.1. Some people will tell you 7.15, which is midpoint between 0.1 and 0.2, but I would say anything around anything lower than 7.15, you should consider giving bicarb because you know the acidosis just compromises a lot of things like the cardiac uh, uh, contractility and literally your pressures don't work well in in an acidic environment. Um, uh, what are the, you also want to check your electrolytes uh, and make sure all of that is is uh, proper. And again, you running through all the system, make sure whatever is not working, you're you're addressing that. One of the other systems you also want to look at is your endocrine. Obviously, glycemic control is an important thing. We typically will go according to the Nice Sugar trial that recommends that we keep sugar between 140 to 180 in these patients. Basically, meaning hypoglycemia or tight glycemic control is not good for them and keeping them in hyperglycemia is also not good for them and we do this basically with insulin we don't use any of the oral uh, medications even if there were oral medications as our patient in critically ill patients would just focus on using insulin to address the, their glycemic control another very important thing is you started off with empiric antibiotics and as you're starting to get some of the results of your blood culture uh, uh, back you're then starting to narrow narrow the, the antibiotic cover to, to tailor to tailor to whatever organism is, is growing in their cultures. So after we've done all of our systemic assessment and trying to fix everything that we're seeing that is wrong, our goal would be, um, you know, to uh, reverse everything that they came in the ICU with, you know, the hypotension, the infectious process, you want to make sure that the white count, for example, is coming down, if they're no longer febrile, uh, you know, if they were intubated, for example, you want to get them out of that, because once you fix everything that's wrong, then it's time for them to leave the ICU, you know, it's time for them to go onto the floors to continue their recovery, and that's typically how I would think about um, the management of sepsis and septic shock. Obviously, this this. this uh, it's something I can go on you know, for six hours talking about management of sepsis and septic shock. But I just felt these are the most important things that you want to do uh, as general consideration. Find it useful as you navigate the floors, the ED, the ICU. Um, I host weekly live IG sessions, so you can feel free to check that as well, as well on my Instagram handle right here, uh, Fatai MD. And you can check out more of my contents on my other Instagram handle, Residence Cove IM. Um, I appreciate you for hanging around and watching this video. I'll see you next time. Subscribe! Subscribe! Thank you very much.